The conclusion to Monster is left open-ended. That's right, we got Inceptioned. Or did we? There is a lot of debate about what the ending means. It's quite a divisive ending, because after 74 episodes of investment, the mystery still feels unsolved. It makes you look at the deeper meanings behind Monster. You could say it's a cliché where it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And that is true. Monster explores the atrocities of humankind and trying to find justice. And the figure of justice is in the form of Dr. Kenzo Tenma. But Monster doesn't just explore evil, it also focuses on the good of humankind. The ending in no shape or form does any detriment to the quality of the story. It's not like Tenma is still on the run and will never know his fate. If they made his arc inconclusive then that would really turn people the wrong way. This ending to Monster is a real mind game, just like the antagonist has been throughout the entire anime. I mean that last shot of the end credits with the empty bed and cool breeze was just haunting. We as viewers are left to decide how this ends. It's almost as if Urasawa is giving us the power to decide Johan's fate. I must stress that Monster is not just all about injustice, evil and psychological torment. There is also a complete flip side to this, which is echoed by our protagonist Dr. Tenma. Although we are displayed with characters who find themselves in dreadful situations, beneath all the bad that is shown in the world, there is also good. And where there is good, there is Dr. Tenma, there is Wolfgang Grimmer, Dieter, Anna Liebert, Dr. Reichwein, and so on. The theme of good versus evil is quite evident in the anime, but it's not a black and white depiction. There are so many grey areas of conflict within each character. This is not your normal good v bad show. The monster lives in everyone, even in someone as virtuous as Tenma. There is a darkness inside of him. Characters such as Inspector Lunge and Ava Heinemann are very complicated in defining whether they are good or bad. In truth, they are simply human. Humans make mistakes. Even people who you generally consider good can do something crazy. What makes Monster such an intriguing show is the way they portray characters who we spend so much time with and don't particularly like. But by the end of the episode we gradually begin to understand why they are the way they are. It's easy to label Ava as this selfish character. She almost feels like an antagonist towards Tenma. As the story progresses, Urasawa shows us a different side to her, which gives us the viewers, a moral thinking session to question whether Ava is good, bad, or just human. Many humans in this world are selfish and cynical, but it's easy to just sit there and judge a person of these negative adjectives rather than understanding why they're like this. In the first episode, during dinner between the then engaged Ava and Tenma, much to Ava's annoyance, Tenma is distracted by not being able to save a Turkish construction worker's life, whom he was supposed to operate on before being told to stop by the director of the hospital to immediately perform on a famous opera singer. When the construction worker died, his wife blamed Tenma for not performing on her husband even though he was at the hospital first and ready for operation. But to everyone else, the opera singer was seen as a bigger priority. Ava comments that not all people are equal. And that one quote is a huge theme about the morality of how one person views another person. Do we judge people based on their race, their social class? This haunted Tenma. He kept thinking about the moment he was told by the superiors to perform on the opera singer. Should he have made the decision by himself to prioritise on the Turkish man over the singer? Because Tenma is a good person, and he believes and insists that all lives are equal. We see different forms of inequality throughout the anime. Tenma is a Japanese surgeon in Germany. When he is unjustly framed, he is immediately profiled as dangerous because he is foreign. The Turkish community are the subject of discrimination in Germany. What impressed me most about Tenma's character is no matter what position he was in, whether he was on the rise as a doctor working his way up the hierarchy, or being framed as this foreign murderer, his ego is the same. When he gets promoted as head surgeon, he remains the same person as he was from the first episode, still wanting to help people and save lives. And when he was on the run, he still prioritised other people's lives over his own. And this would go on to help his case, because of the positive impact he had on all of the characters he met across Germany and Czech Republic. His innocence was irrefutable when his case was taken to court. On so many occasions, Tenma could have swayed into a cynical and brute character with no hope. But he remained true to what he believed in and was thus rewarded and proved innocent. The neo-Nazi element applies an elevated angle on racism in Germany. And then there is Johann Liebert, who does not harbour the racism and prejudice the neo-Nazis do. He looks down on all humans. They are all inferior. There is a great conundrum regarding Johann. He commits despicable acts to his victims through the way of manipulation, treating them as nothing but lab rats, as he sees humans as nothing. It's never shown Johan in rapture of his doings. He is not like the Joker, who laughs and laughs and revels in his chaos. 
He is quite calm and composed, almost bored at times. And this begs the question, is Johan acting by his own will of freedom and power, or is his fate as a monster something that cannot be changed and was always inevitable? Johan leaves Dr. Tenma a sign crying for help and claiming that the monster is inside of him. Now, he could be trying to play with Tenma's moral code, or he could genuinely be telling the truth. Just like the ending, there are multiple alternatives to consider. A character like Johan makes it incredibly difficult to examine the value of truth and morality. Is Johan in control of his own destiny, his own decisions, or are all of his intentions based on free will? The reason I have difficulty in understanding Johan's motives and whether they are solely his is down to where he was shaped to become the monster. Kinderheim 511 the orphanage that experiments on children with the goal of creating perfect soldiers. This is where the monster of Johan was created. It was forced into him through the most cruel and inhumane environment. People such as Hartmann, Bonaparte and Petrov were responsible for the making of Johan, even though the result was quite different to what they had all hoped. It is possible to entirely blame a person who had experienced such a traumatic incident that shaped him to be a psychopath. To what degree would you hold a child accountable for murder? When Johan killed all three of his adoptive parents, was he aware of the consequence, the value of life? The fact that he felt nothing would suggest he is a rare anomaly of a human who shows no remorse in acts of violence. Or it suggests that he had been educated in this way during his experience in Kinderheim 511. Johan manipulates an orphan in the most cruel way. There is no way to justify anything that Johan is doing in this situation, even though it might not be his own decision. How do you deal with someone so complex and evil as Johan? Do you feel sorry for him at any point when you learn about his past? If he had lived a normal childhood like everyone else without the experience of Kinderheim 511, would he still have displayed his dark side to the world? That darkness is inside all of us. But what chased Johan to the line where he had no regard for the lives he took? He didn't actually become the perfect experiment that Bonaparte and Petrov had imagined. His disregard for all life was a path that he found by himself. He was a child when he committed his first murder, but as he grew up there was no remorse about his actions. He became worse. There had been a lot of children in Kinderheim 511, and a lot of them were innocent and scared. Johan was calm during his time there. It's very possible that he would have remained this way if Kinderheim 511 never existed. Even if he went to a normal school in his hometown in Czech Republic, where he would have been taught to be a polite boy and always behave accordingly, this probably would have had very little effect on Johan's mind and the way he sees the world. And I go back to what you would do when trying to take Johan down. And in this instance, we find ourselves in Tenma's shoes, a man who is the complete opposite of Johan. He is the angel to Johan's devil, but Tenma is constantly tested against his own beliefs and codes as a doctor. Does he abandon everything he morally believes in to kill Johan? And if he were to go through with killing him, he would no longer be the same person. In The Girl and the Seasoned Soldier, army veteran Hugo warns Tenma of the consequences of taking a person's life. You can carry a great weight of burden that you take to the grave. During Tenma's stay at the veteran's house, an orphaned girl from Myanmar lives with Hugo under his care. Tenma learns that the girl's mother was killed in the war by Hugo himself. This act is what separates Hugo from the likes of Johan. He is taking responsibility for his actions because he feels a great sense of remorse for taking the life of the girl's mother. A recurring theme throughout the anime is Tenma's internal conflict of morality. He is in a situation where he must act differently to his usual self. He is inexperienced in the act of killing and is thus naive to the consequences. Even the veteran's warnings are not enough to sway Tenma's mind, because a part of him already knows that he will carry a burden of regret like the veteran if he were to kill Johan. He had many attempts to actually kill him. There was a time in the park where he could have shot Johan, but he was surrounded by children and could not go through with it. If this were reversed, I have no doubt Johan would not care in the slightest if the children were in the way, as he has no moral guilt about how this would affect them. I mean, if we look at this from the author's point of view, the reason why Johan is such a wicked human being is probably because Urasawa wanted to have someone who can constantly question and undermine Tenma. He believes that all lives are equal, but throughout the show he is in pursuit of a man with only one thing on his mind, to rid him of this world. But you could argue that Johan is that rare, once in a lifetime exception. Tenma realizes how dangerous Johan is to society and will remain a threat. Tenma's thoughts and intentions of good have changed and you can see how this has impacted him visually. He is less enthusiastic and always grim. The person he is turning into is exactly what Johan wants. He is showing Tenma his view of the world through his absurdly violent and chaotic lens. Even if Johan is the exception, that immediately contradicts Tenma's values of equality. 
Taking someone's life for the atrocities they've committed is not something Tenma himself would believe is the best way to punish someone. Does it make Tenma a bad person for trying to kill Johan? No, but he could have protested his innocence on numerous occasions rather than track down Johan as a vigilante. Something awakened inside of Tenma that made him pursue Johan. It was almost as if he was intrigued by him, like the monster had partially awoken inside of him, and that darkness was displayed by his rugged appearance as the show progresses. Urusawa wanted the story to be set in Germany. It was a naturally convenient setting for the story of Monster to take place when you consider the factors of its notorious history of the 20th century, and the fact that Japanese medicine was heavily influenced by German medicine, and the arc of racial superiority is instinctively linked to the source of evil. But Urasawa has gone for a different kind of evil, in the form of Johan. Now it's about to get heavy, and this is what I believe Kinderheim 511 to be partially inspired by. I'm probably not the best guy to talk about this subject, far from it. But the eugenics experiments are heavily linked to the Nazi human experiments in World War II. From 1942 to 1945, at least 16,000 people were subject to medical torture in concentration camps. Many of the victims who survived were left disabled as a result. Inmates were selected for many different experiments. In relation to Monster, there was the advancement of racial ideology and the other being eugenics. And the eugenics experiment was famous for its twin experiment by Joseph Mengel. A survivor of the Holocaust and Mengel's inhumane experiments was Vera Kriegel. She was from Czechoslovakia. At just five years of age, Vera, her twin sister Olga and her mother were taken straight to SS Captain Joseph Mengel at Auschwitz. I don't know for certain if Urasawa used the Kriegel twins as inspiration for the Liebert twins, but it's quite difficult not to put two and two together. Mengel had hundreds of children to experiment on, and he would never be in trouble if they died. It is believed that Mengel was interested in genetics, in particular the different colour of eyes. Vera's mother was considered a fine specimen of the Aryan race with her blue eyes. In contrast, her daughters Vera and Olga had brown eyes. The experiments of the twins was to prove that genetic inheritance is determined by traits, preferences and temperament, as opposed to the environment they live in. And this research would subsequently strengthen the case that the Aryan race is superior to all other races. And what these experiments consisted of were just pure evil. He would amputate a limb or deliberately infect one twin with a disease, and then transfuse the blood of one twin to its other twin. Many of the surviving children have little memory or none of the experiments. But a woman who did remember was Yona Lax, who was taken as a teenager to Auschwitz. She was set to be executed by the gas chamber before Mengel found out that she was a twin. Yona recalled people's organs being removed without anaesthetic. He killed people with an injection to the heart. Now you can compare some similarities of Mengel to Franz Bonaparte. Although their eugenics experiments differ, they are both responsible for the results of the experiments. They both fled and lived out their lives under exile. Though what clearly distinguishes the two is that Bonaparte regretted his experiments. Mengel did not. When he fled to South America, Mengel always carried a suitcase of his research. It was interesting that Urasawa chose to make Bonaparte repentant towards his experiments. Perhaps it was because the result of Johann Liebert was never what he imagined. But I found this piece of history from the Nazis to be terrifying, and Urasawa created Johann Lieber as a metaphor to the ideal world that Mengel and his associates saw as the path to a better world. Let's look at the tale of the nameless monster written by Bonaparte under the Elias Emil Scherber. There were two monsters, one went east and one went west. You can clearly connect the two monsters to the Lieber twins. A recurring sentence in the story could provide some detail into the mind of Johan. Look at me, look at me, the monster inside of me is getting bigger, as it literally grows too big for the person it has been living off, and then proceeds to eat the person, exposing his true self to the world. The monster goes to various people, offering them strength, good health and whatever they desire, so long as the monster is bestowed the person's name in return. It's no different to making a deal with the devil. All of these people wanted to be better than what they originally were. The huntsman and the blacksmith wanted to become stronger as a way to boost their ego and status to the local town. But when the monster entered the young prince, he enjoyed the royal life and grew fond of the boy's name. So he refrained from eating, simply because he preferred the life of luxury. The human and the monster became one. The monster became hungry in a literal sense, but the human also became hungry in a metaphorical sense to strive for more, never satisfied with what they have, until their ego grows so inflated that the monster finally reveals itself, in a way that reveals the truth of the human. Perhaps this egotistical view that so many humans have in common is what caused Johan to have a nihilistic approach on life. 
Johan is searching for an identity of his own. Whatever that is, it's difficult to decipher. The ending of his mysterious vanishing almost suggests that he found his identity. But like the tale of the nameless monster, the ending has the boy with the monster from the east eat the monster from the west. And although the boy finally had a name, there was no longer anyone left to call him by it. Johan may have finally found his identity, but no one was present to witness. He was all alone, and the ending makes it appear as though he never existed. In the fairy tale, the nameless monster of the east had eaten everyone. Therefore, what purpose did the monster now have when he is all alone? Johan could no longer harm and kill as he pleased, and the people who knew his true identity were no longer around or had moved on. Therefore, what purpose did he have to go on now that he is truly alone? So alone that no one could find him. Monster is a terrifying look at how cruel one person can be. The atmosphere is truly a haunting experience. There are so many complex storylines being shifted and sewn as the story diverges from Tenma's arc to various characters that help shape the conclusion to the story. It is by far one of the most enthralling stories I have had the pleasure to witness. Even though it channels extremely dark themes of psychological torture, it's a story that always keeps me questioning and thinking. Whatever the true meaning of monster is meant to be, it's one that sends a chill down your spine. That empty bed centered next to a cool breeze from the window is an image that will always stick with you.